then, beginning in October 2005, we had a new comics continuity, a Haunted Mansion comic book line that was released quarterly until October 2007. These are anthology comics published by the unfortunately named Slave Labor Graphics from a number of different writers and artists. Seven issues were released, and an eighth was in development, but never put out but some of the stories from it have leaked online. Issue one has six stories. The first, Room for a Thousand, is another of these adaptations that basically has a character go through the scenes of the ride in order, but instead of that character being a living guest, it's a hopeful ghost who wants to move in and become the thousandth happy haunt. He himself still seems a little scared by some of the other residents, but then he scares the only living human in the story, the groundskeeper, and then he feels confident and at home in the mansion but we, the living, are reminded that they still have room for another. This is just about perfect. It's nearly all the scenes you like in the ride, with only a few omissions, but those get covered in other stories in this issue. But it doesn't focus on boring humans taking up space. It's the first demonstration that a Haunted Mansion story could just be about the ghosts. It faithfully adapts the ride as we know it, while reminding us of the potential of this series. There's 999 happy haunts here, and there's room to hear all of their stories. The second story, Blueprint for Murder, is about the building of the mansion and only features three characters, all of whom are named after Imagineers. Mr. Gracie hires Mr. Coates and Mr. Davis to build the mansion for him. And as a probable nod to Claude and Mark's differing ideologies in building the mansion, Mr. Coates and Davis do not get along. And Coates plans Davis's murder, not knowing that Davis was planning the same thing for Coates. So this is revealed to be the backstory for the coffin occupant and the candelabra down the hallway. I like tying those two haunts together since they're so near each other in the ride. And yeah, as far as potential backstories for elements of the mansion go, this one works for me. The third, while the Fifi is away, focuses on ghosts we don't get a lot of stories about, the ghosts in the pet cemetery. It's about a poodle who thinks her owner, the beating heart bride, misses her more than she actually does. Husband, I gaze nightly in search of you, yet I know you will never return to me. Why does my heart still beat for you so? And why does that little rat dog keep staring at me? It's pretty funny, and it adds some lore that outside ghosts can't go in the mansion and inside ghosts can't come out. The fourth story, Talking Heads, is about the beheaded knight coming to Madame Leota who doesn't realize she's dead. A spirit from beyond. How marvelous. My powers must be improving. I didn't even go into a trance, and yet here you are. But Madame Leota, you yourself are... Ah! Just go with it. She's been dead for who knows how long. But I'll be darned if I can convince her of it. I see. I don't know how I feel about Oblivious Leota. It's a unique take, but I feel like I prefer Leota as a font of wisdom rather than her as a sort of Buzz Lightyear oblivious that she's the same as those around her. The fifth story, The New Groundskeeper, is a little story about the groundskeeper, whose name apparently is not Clyde, but is in fact Horace Fusselbottom, and he is fired from taking care of the mansion and replaced by this 80s movie bully. But Horace gives an ominous warning that they won't like a stranger there, and sure enough, when the bully arrives, the ghosts just want to know where Horace is, and they chase the bully out to the point of the hitchhiking ghost following him home. So that's a good way to work in the one bit of lore that doesn't really work if you're just following a ghost who's not leaving. It's a different interpretation of the groundskeeper role than his usual scaredy cat self. You know, the version that the first story in this issue went with. But I kind of dig that the groundskeeper and the ghosts have a cordial relationship here. That is a fun interpretation, that the ghosts have their token living friend that they like. The final segment is part one of an ongoing story, and we'll get to that in a moment. But issue two begins with another story about the groundskeeper and his secret. Uncle Theodore sings why the groundskeeper continues to work this job if he's so scared all the time. Turns out, his wife is buried here, and he dines with her every night. I don't know if this shares a canon with the earlier Groundskeeper story or not, since the wife seems to be the only ghost Horace has any sort of relationship with here, but it's a sweet little story. It's interesting that this is a story about holding on to the past, when so many ghost stories are about learning to let go of life, but this is also a story about how learning to live with your fears can lead to something rewarding, and I'll take that over the movie's handling of facing fears. The next story in issue two is called Lenore Meets the Haunted Mansion, and no, it's not an origin story for the Raven. This is a crossover with SLG's original character, Lenore the Cute Little Dead Girl. 
I don't know anything about this character beyond her appearance in the story, which involves her going to the mansion because she's trying to sleep and she's annoyed by the noise. She moves through the mansion and riffs on various elements of it, and in this case it seems to have elements of being a real haunted mansion and elements of being a theme park attraction. She gets to the source of the noise, the 20,000 Leagues organ, and then she gets distracted and doesn't move through the rest of the mansion. Much like the movie, here Lenore's jokes are kind of deflating the mansion rather than enhancing it, but I accept that more here because it's coming from another spooky being and not some dumb mortal, and also this isn't a feature film. Still, I imagine this works better as a Lenore comic guest starring the Haunted Mansion than it does as a Haunted Mansion comic guest starring Lenore, but I don't actually know. Lenore Debotes would have to answer that for me. The next story, The Woman in Black, is about a young boy escaping the terrifying Woman in Black by hiding out in the mansion where he meets a ghost boy named Victor who takes him to Leota. There's still more stuff about Leota being confused, and that's just gonna be a running thing here, isn't it? But Leota does still have wisdom, and she tells him that he doesn't belong and that he needs to face his fears. So he faces the Woman in Black, only to discover that she's only looking for her son, Victor. So, once again, we have a sweet little twist, and a much better use of the facing your fears idea than Eddie's son went through. I'm not saying this entire comic series is an apology for the movie, but I'm not not saying that either. The Big Nap is the first of our stories to focus on the hitchhiking ghosts, and it's a wordless little story about Gus and the circumstances that led him to being a prisoner, and then a ghost, and then a hitchhiker. It's lighter in tone than a lot of these stories, but I feel like it would legitimately make a great animated short. The first story of issue 3 focuses not on the groundskeeper, but on his dog, who's digging up bones, much to the chagrin of the ghosts those bones belong to. But when they find out he's bringing the bones to orphan puppies, they decide they can spare them. We have had as many sweet twists in these stories as we've had creepy twists. I like that the individual stories are allowed so many different tones. Next is The Mummy's Curse, a short little backstory for the tea-drinking mummy, who was cursed with a thousand curses by Anubis, and had to pass them all on to others. And he feels he may be responsible for the curses on Gracie Manor. Of course, his companion doesn't really hear his confession. Next is The Peppermint Girl, where two boys sneak into the mansion and fall for a wallflower in the ballroom, so they each race to to remove themselves from the land of the living first so they can be her dance partner. And yet, each attempt is unsuccessful. The darkly comic twist is that neither of them realize they're both dead, and they're both too wrapped up in their competition to actually dance with the Peppermint Girl. I love this, it's so sitcom-y. It's just like Frasier and Niles competing over a girl and being so focused on the competition that they don't realize that they both have a chance if they just made a move. Look, when I said I wasn't going to tie every video back to Cheers and Frasier, I lied. Issue 4 begins with the first installment of a second ongoing story. Again, we'll get to all the ongoing stories later. The second story is Big Game, about a hunter who has bagged all manner of mythical creatures, but what he wants is to hunt a ghost. So he goes to the mansion and selects his prey, and he chooses the Executioner, presumably based on his doorman abilities. But the only way he can tussle with the ghost is to become one himself, so he ingests some poison, and is immediately welcomed as a mansion resident and doesn't have a chance to hunt, leaving his sidekick stuck out of luck. Then we return to the pet cemetery for Night of the Ghost Fleas, in which our dear Fifi is frustrated by fleas, and frustrated by trying to follow the logic of ghost rules, and even annoyed by the hitchhiking ghosts themselves. It's another piece where the humor comes from deflating the mansion rather than working with it. The jokes are amusing, but it's far more of a mansion parody than a mansion story proper. No wonder it's written by the same writer of the Lenore story. Still, in an anthology, it's okay if some of the pieces take a more irreverent tone with the source material. Issue 5 begins with a dynamite party, and it's the backstory of the dynamite guy from the stretching portraits. Basically, he's a real jerk to his wife, he gets an invite to a party at Gracie Manor, he goes pantsless just to spite her, and he can't see what's going on so he's oblivious to the hauntings and the spookiness, and his inability to see leads to him sealing his own fate. So it's the Lockhorns meets Mr. Magoo meets Grunkle Stan, I guess. In the next story, Blue Loop Guru, the mummy asks the werewolf why he's so sad. The werewolf explains the story of how he got trapped in the mansion, but that's not really what's making him sad. What's making him sad is that there's nothing to eat because even the fish are ghosts! Wah wah! Then another installment of an ongoing story, and then the Pickwick Capers, the backstory for Pickwick, the chandelier ghost. 
Pickwick had a fear of heights instilled in him at a young age, so he became a great cat burglar by sneaking under things. A mysterious stranger at a bar challenges him to steal the pirate gold from Gracie Manor. So he manages to sneak in underneath. But it turns out it's not heights that do him in, it's depths, as he can't survive the stretching room. But he got over his fear of heights, so that's something. This feels the most, like, ironic prequel joke version of all these stories. It's like, oh yeah, that high up guy, he used to be scared of heights. It's like, things used to be the opposite of how they are now. James Bond didn't used to care whether his martinis were shaken or stirred. But, you know, it's cute. Issue 6 is, uh, mostly ongoing stories, but the one sort of standalone story in it is Doom of the Diva. The backstory for the opera lady, Baronessa Elda. Despite being an operatic talent, her career has taken a downturn due to her difficult reputation, but she gets invited to sing at Gracie Manor. She's confused when she has no audience, but when she starts singing, the ghosts start arriving. And this terrifies her. She tries to escape while some prankish spirits tie her hair to the balcony, but Gracie appeals to her ego. But she's scared over the balcony and her neck is broken by her own hair. Dark. But at least she sticks around to sing for everyone forever. Issue 7 begins with another wordless hitchhiking ghost story, Laugh I Thought I'd Die, featuring Ezra. Ezra apparently sells novelties and gags. But when sales start to go down, he scours the world for new gags and discovers a Chinese finger trap in this sequence that is, um, probably not the most culturally sensitive thing we've encountered here. And he's stuck in the finger trap and, uh, laughs himself to death, I think. And then he gets invited to the mansion, where he annoys all the other ghosts with his gags, so he's hitchhiking for a way out. Next is On a Tight Rope, the backstory of the tightrope girl in the stretching portraits. In this continuity, her name is Daisy de la Cruz, and she tightropes over alligators as a carnival act in the bayou. She is collecting so many suitors, and it turns out she's turning them into gators. And the gators are waiting for their revenge. Then we move on to Three of a Kind about another stretching portrait, the Quicksand Guys whose names in this story are Hobbs, Big Hobbs, and Skinny Hobbs. These three are traveling gambling men, but when a certain Bartholomew Gore catches them cheating, he chases them out to the swamp. Of course, they come across quicksand, and when they can't decide how to cross it, they decide to gamble for who should carry each other. And they continue to be stuck there to this day. Issue 8 was never released, but two stories from it were leaked. The first is Preaching to the Choir, which is the backstory of the little ghosts that come out of the organ. Turns out they're a school bus full of dead children. Yeah, this one's dark, and the bus driver is the creepiest thing we've seen in these comics so far. The other is the last of the hitchhiking ghost stories, The Doctor is In, about Phineas or as he's known here, Dr. Phineas Q. Hackenbush. He was a flim-flam medicine man who sold a bunch of snake oil to a bunch of suckers, but when he's chased out of town, he falls to his death. So he's invited to the mansion, where he tries his tricks again, and ends up making the ghosts think they're sick, I think? Much to Madame Leota's confusion. So she has words with him, and then he's trying to get out of there, just like the other hitchhikers. Okay, now that we've looked at all the one-off stories, it's time to look at the ongoing stories, starting back in issue one with part one of The Mystery of the Manse. The Hanging Ghost Host checks in with us after we've read the other little stories in the issue. Yes, the Ghost Host was once William Gracie, the first mate on the sailing ship Pomona. When Captain Pace is facing a dangerous storm, despite the crew's protests, Gracie discovers that Pace has been secretly gun smuggling and not sharing the profits with the crew. Gracie confronts Paste, but then the storm starts breaking the ship, and Pace is stuck tied to the ropes. Rather than free Pace, Gracie, in his anger, cuts his head off and puts his head in a hat box. Ah, see what they did there? And at the point of the story's publication, the hatbox ghost was still missing in action, so this wouldn't have been like a deep, deep, deep cut, but still a deep-ish cut for this story to use. And that was how William Gracie became Captain Blood. The story continues in issue two, which is as much a Pirates of the Caribbean comic as it is a Haunted Mansion comic. From that day on, it was all yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me. But as the age of piracy is over, Gracie plans his escape from this lifestyle, and it involves betraying his entire crew in exchange for safe passage to New Orleans. In issue three, the Pirates of the Caribbean connections come to a close as Gracie arrives at Lafitte's Landing. 
Gracie is told of a mansion he can retire to, which I guess means this doesn't share continuity with that earlier story where he hired Coates and Davis to build the mansion, but hey. Mystery surrounded the place. Even the men who designed and built the house had disappeared shortly after its completion. Or that story did happen, it just wasn't Gracie who hired them, I guess? Look, again, I like that the continuity is kind of muddled between the different stories here because it makes them feel more like ghost stories that have been passed on and embellished. So Gracie becomes the latest person to kind of go through the scenes in the mansion, or at least the ones that exist at this point in the narrative. He's scared, but he's home. In part four, anime boyfriend Gracie here falls in love with Emily DeClaire. He asks Emily to marry him, but realizes he needs to exercise the house if she's going to live there. And that's when Leota enters the picture. And Leota's interested in Gracie while he's still in love with Emily, and... I don't know, like, jealous, spurned lover love triangle Leota? I think I like even less than clueless Leota. But I guess if Gracie chooses Leota, then they'll get married, he'll change his name to Mr. Ghoul, and then they'll invite Mickey and the gang over to clean the mansion. But that doesn't happen in this continuity. Instead, Leota does her famous seance ostensibly to remove all the ghosts. But she has different ideas when she realizes that the ghosts are the crew that Gracie betrayed. So without telling Gracie, she turns the mansion into a magnet for ghosts. But as far as he's concerned, the ghosts have all gone away because he has no idea who's just been summoned to the mansion. Oh snap, Gracie versus Hatbox, it's gonna go down! In part five, we go to the day of the wedding, but Leota arrives to cause trouble because we're really sticking with jealous spurned Leota here. Emily looks in the attic for something old and finds an old hat box. But the ghost of the dead captain arrives and tells her the truth about her fiance. Would you have left him if you knew that William Gracie was once the infamous Captain Blood, Scourge of the Caribbean? Would you feel differently about him if you knew he betrayed his crew, my crew, and left them to die so he could escape with their treasure? When Gracie hears his bride-to-be screams, he races up to the attic to find her speechless on the floor as his old captain and his old crew are gathered. Poor, poor William. Seems your precious love died of a broken heart. Wow, I thought that condition only affected people from Naboo. But on the hatbox captain's way out, he reveals the truth. It was Leota who summoned him. And Gracie murders Leota mid-seance. He realizes redemption is beyond him now, so he takes the only way out. There's always his way. But then, the story continues in part six. Leota's sudden death caused her to not even realize it had happened and to continue her seance, forever making the mansion a beacon for wayward ghosts. And we get a little explanation for why there are so many different types of ghosts, even ones that don't really fit together. The one living person still around is Michelle, the maid, who opportunistically continues to take care of the house so she can access the pirate gold. And Gracie tells us the current state of the mansion, and the listener tries to escape. As mansion backstories go, there is a lot I like in it, and then there are quite a few things that I really don't like, but overall, it's a better backstory than the movie gave the mansion. But now we move on to the other ongoing story, which is, um, two ongoing stories, or really one ongoing story that was about to set up another ongoing story, but, uh, well, you'll see. This begins at the start of issue 4 with The Interview. A young girl named Sarah is racing to the mansion for an interview to be the new housekeeper. The maid interviewing her, presumably Michelle, gives her the lay of the land. She also tells Sarah something she didn't realize. She died on her way to the mansion. But it turns out she's not fully dead yet, and she's brought back just in the nick of time. But she has mixed feelings about it. Oh man. I just blew another interview. This looked like such a nice place to live. This first part of the story kind of seems like a way to reconcile seemingly incongruous theories about the mansion, both that you yourself die when you fall out of the attic and that you escape to the land of the living and a ghost follows you home. This first installment of the story kind of has that cake and eats it too. The girl did die, but she is still going home at the end. Of course, it's not quite the end yet. In the middle of issue 5, we get the follow-up interview. 
Sarah can't stop thinking about how much fun the ghosts looked like they were having in Gracie Manor. Her boyfriend Steve is not very patient with this. I thought you were done with your bad goth poetry phase, Sarah. Do you have to be a jerk all the time, Steve? Do I have to be? No, it just works out that way. Sarah ultimately decides she wants to go back to Gracie Manor. In issue six, Steve races to the mansion to try to stop her, but instead, he begins the journey through the mansion tour. Sarah arrives a little later and runs into the groundskeeper, who tells us a little more about his wife. Sarah talks about how much she wants to live with the ghosts, but the groundskeeper tells her it's not worth it. So Sarah has reconsidered her goals by the time Michelle finds her. Well, I came here to die so I could live forever, but Dick here convinced me that it wasn't such a great idea. Also, the groundskeeper's named Dick in this story and not Horace. Flexible continuity. But in all the chaos, Steve gets scared to death. And he is the 1,000th Happy Haunt. Which, um, leads to the mansion getting sucked up into the ground? Well, that was certainly, uh, something. And this was all leading somewhere, because in the final issue, issue 7, we got part 1 of a spin-off, a joint spin-off, of both The Mystery of the Mance and the interview, The Misery of the Mance. While the mansion's being sucked into whatever wormhole it's being sucked into, Gracie seems to come back to life, back to his human form. He tries to explain to Steve that he's dead, but even he doesn't understand what happened afterwards, until Leota shows up, once again in full body form. I'm here to see you get your just rewards, William. I'm here for you to face judgment. Judgment? What are you talking about, you crazy witch? I'm talking about how while you were murdering me, I was cursing you to a thousand years of suffering and agony. <laughs> condemning you to feel the wrath and anguish of everyone you had murdered in your worthless lifetime. Well, that should come as a relief to the mummy that the curses weren't all his fault. Turns out Leota used to talk about when the thousandth ghost arrived, something big would happen. Some horrible fate. And with the mansion seemingly being dragged to hell, Sarah dives in after it. And... The saga ends on that cliffhanger, because of all the stories leaked from issue 8, uh, the follow-up to this was not one of them. At least not yet. So, we'll never know where that story was going, but it was certainly an unexpected direction. I didn't love every individual story here, but I really liked the format of this series. An anthology of mansion stories with overlapping, but not necessarily identical continuities. Much like the ghost stories surrounding the mansion itself, they can't all be true, but maybe they all have a bit of truth. I wish I could have seen where the ongoing story was going, but in the meantime, I'm glad the stories that were published are here for our enjoyment. So hurry back, we would like your company.